spirit, by the way. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome Hello. to Betsy Freeman Live. Um, thank you for bearing with us. We had a little technical snafu. Sometimes the littlest toggle can create the biggest challenges. Um, but I'm here with three authors and who have gone through the challenges and travails of publishing and or self-publishing in the last um, several years. For some of you, it's been a long journey and some of you are just getting started on your journey as well as those who are watching. Um, and I'm sure you all have your own stories to tell um, in, the, in the publishing process. Um, so I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about your books and tell us about um, uh, where you are, what your latest publishing adventure has been like to start out. So I'm going to ask April to go first because I have her book and it's out just this month. It's just new. I just got mine in the mail. I'm only 24 pages in. It's called The Sacred Pulse. It's from Broadleaf Publishing, which is an imprint of 1517 Media, which is actually a Lutheran publisher. And April is a Presbyterian minister. She doesn't have to go into that if she doesn't want to, but I just wanted <laughs> to mention that she's coming up to us from Nebraska, and we've been friends for many years. So April, take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Betsy. Yeah, um, my book, The Sacred Pulse, Holy Rhythms for Overwhelmed Souls, the official release date is actually December 14th, but Amazon decided to start shipping it out to people about three weeks early, which was really unexpected, but super exciting. Um, and this book, it is about the importance of listening for the sacred and life-giving rhythms of God in our daily activities. Everything from how we eat our meals to how we grieve both small and big losses, how we deal with unexpected interruptions and unexpected free time. And um, I wrote it during a pandemic, which was a time when I needed to relearn how to do all of those things. And so this book really has been a gift for me personally. And my hope is that it will be a gift for anyone else who's trying to figure out what their life looks like now that it's been disrupted and upheaved the way that it has. Um, but yeah, that's my, my first traditionally published book. Uh, very super excited. Thank you for inviting me to share. You're very welcome. Yeah, every time I, it's been a really nice break. I'm in the middle of moving. So it's been really nice to sort of take space for myself, breathe for just a few minutes and read a little bit. And it honestly just makes me feel so peaceful. So I highly recommend it to anyone who is looking to take a little space for themselves every day. Okay, Tiffany, Tiffany and I know each other from singing adventures and traveling adventures. And I didn't even know for, I think for years that she was also a very accomplished fantasy author on top of all the other things that she does, which um, both April and Tiffany and maybe Kate as well, but I know you two are both uh, costume creators as well, so we won't go into that a lot today, but maybe someday, because clothes and like the fantasy world is filled with like, um, you know, color and, and all of those things like were so prominent in your book, Stella Toile, um, which made me so excited reading it. Um, so tell us more about you, Tiffany. Ah, I love this book. <laughs> There's several. <laughs> My name is Tiffany Carmel Lake, or just Tiffany Carmel, if you know me in the singing world. And um, and I wrote the Stella Twal series, and I am still writing the Stella Twal series. And um, it is kind of a medieval sword and sorcery, epic fantasy type thing. Um, starts off very Romeo and Juliet, and then it just kind of exploded from there and uh and i have always thought that i would just write until there's until the characters shut up <laughs> until there's nothing left to write about um so i am and will that ever happen because they're very those are epic characters that you created and they've got like very intense personalities Oh, thank you. Well, I was really, I was really intrigued by a lot of, um, of, of archetypes that fall in this gray area where maybe they're a good person or a good character, but they, um, but sometimes their methods are not especially uh good <laughs> or they have or sometimes they don't have the best of results and um and sometimes characters that are actually 
um, more negatively motivated um, can actually accomplish some really amazing things. And so I was really intrigued by these um, these characters that are good, good and bad, and just kind of depending on the day or the year or what's going on in their lives, whatever challenges they're facing. And so um, my books follow several generations of characters. So characters are born and characters die and there's wars and there's uh, love, love stories. And it, it follows just several different, several different character arcs. And so it's been an interesting juggle. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. Okay, I can, I honestly like it. It'll probably take me. Uh, well, I anyways, I'm gonna. I won't jump into the weeds too much with you for on that yet, because I want to <laughs> make sure that Kate gets a chance to talk about her her book. And she, I'm sure that you two will have a lot in common, Kate. Let's yes. <laughs> Wait. Okay, I'm just making sure I wasn't accidentally muted because. Uh, as you can see, my dog is quite the love bug and she's a needy thing. I blame, I, we're pretty sure she's at least half lab. It's probably where it comes Aww. from. Hmm. Anyway, um, yeah, so I have a very, very similar genre. Um, it is also kind of an epic fantasy, but it also has a lot of, has a lot of darker elements. Um, it follows, um, well, it's, it's this, four part series that follows four mortal elves, which they're half mortal, half elf. Um, and the first book follows a man named Solon de Quirilago. Um, He is the bastard son of an elf duke who the, the duke creates a war called the Crusade of Light in order to legally murder his, his firstborn son. Um, <laughs> Very dark, very dark. Um, the biggest thing about this is not necessarily the fantasy, the fantastical elements, but it um, overall, all the characters, they it focuses a lot on mental health. Um, Solon, for example, suffers from complex PTSD, which is very different from regular PTSD. Complex PTSD stems from um, long-term trauma, trauma from things such as child abuse, um, sex trafficking, things like that. So he was heavily abused as a child. There are other things that, that caused um, his trauma as well. So he's, he's suffering from that while also trying to maintain um, his own moral compass. And he's a very morally gray character. <laughs> um, he has his methods that are not necessarily good. Um, so a real heavy, um, real heavy emphasis on mental health and also um, LGBTQ, um, a lot of that in there as well. So, so and you're in the world of self-publishing now. You're looking at putting out your own, your own start to the series, and it's coming out in January. You said, right? Uh, it'll be available for pre-sale. I'm hoping by the end of January, wow. the official release date is June 1st, 2022. That's right. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yes. The Grim. Yes. Awesome. Book one, book one of the Requiem for the Mortal Elves. Requiem for Mortal Elves. I love it. All right. So, all right. So we shared a little bit about the publishing process for each of you, but I'm going to ask a broader question and you could have, I'll say, take, try to self-regulate to three or four minutes on this because this is a very broad question. And I want to make sure we get to the other questions if we can. And I don't want to interrupt you. So I don't usually say that to people, but like keep an eye on the clock. What brought you to the place where you are now choosing to publish or self-publish your work? And I'll go back to April 1st. Sure. Um, about 11 years ago or so, I very poorly self-published a book and then promptly shamed myself that I should never publish anything again because I did such a terrible job. Um, does that sound like perfectionism? Maybe just a little bit. Um, so anyway, I've been toying with other projects. I've written other things, but I've really gotten in my own way over and over and over. And um, back Two Octobers ago, I got an email out of the blue from an acquisitions editor from this new imprint, Broadleaf Books, asking if I had a book proposal. 
And after I kind of picked my job off the floor and investigated to make sure it was legitimate, um, I said, well, yeah, I've got one, but I've never finished it because I just keep getting in my own way. And she said, well, I would really love to read something by you. If you can get me your proposal um, soon, I'll bring it to our team. And I said, okay. So I started working on it, but again, continued getting in my own way. And being the kind and gracious, but also deadline giving editor that she was, she emailed and said, if you can get it to me by the end of the month, that would be great. Otherwise it's gonna be after the first of the year before we can look at it. And that really lit a fire under me. Um, and I was shocked that they not only looked at my proposal, they also accepted it and extended me a contract. And so that was how I got into traditional publishing. Um, and it's, it's been wonderful because I'm a person who gets in my own way a lot. I'm self-motivated, but I also have a lot of negative self-talk, that, that inner critic that's not a very good friend. And so having someone who can say, I need it by this date was really important for me. Um, so I guess that's really just how I stuck my toe in to traditional publishing, but I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts. Yeah, me too. I think uh, that, yeah, that inner critic, everybody has it. Some of it, some of it is good, right? Because that's what helps us become good editors. But then some yes. of it, we should really give ourselves more freedom. So Caitlin, can you uh, answer that question for, for us as well? What brought us to this, brought you to the place where you are right now? Oh gosh. Um, so I, I actually can go back a couple of decades almost. Um, I was vacationing up here in the Pacific Northwest, had an idea for a story because it was just so beautiful. Happened to be living in California at the time. I just moved up here at the beginning of the year. And lo and behold, full circle, I'll be publishing my, my debut novel based on the world that I started building back when I was in junior high. Um, so I, I had actually done a lot of YouTube research, mostly watching author tubes and um, how to's on both how to query a book for traditional and how and like when I should self publish versus traditional and um, I kind of came to the conclusion that number one, I wanted to keep my own rights um, for this particular series. I'm planning on narrating my own audiobook for it. Um, I also was very much, okay, if I publish this traditionally, there's no guarantee that I will ever be able to publish the second, third, and fourth installments, whereas it is a guarantee if I self-publish. So that's kind of where um, my desires hit. Um, I do eventually plan on cracking into the traditional publishing world, but most likely with like a one-off or maybe a two parts, like a duology or something, depending on how well Requiem does. This is exciting. All right, yeah, so something that you had an idea for 20 years ago, that's amazing. Tiffany. My writing started as a journaling project <laughs> that I really didn't want to do. <laughs> Um, I was going through a really super rough patch in my life. I was really depressed. I had just finished uh, doing a residency uh, with San Diego Opera and my manager had dropped me because I wasn't working at the moment. And it was, and so I started working in a wellness center and, um, and I just felt like so stifled. I just, it, it, it was, I was with these amazing, wonderful healers and these and these great people, and I just felt like my I felt like I was dying inside. And so my friend Sandra, who's also an author, her name's Sandra Beckwith. Um, she had she said, "Well, why don't you journal about it?" And I was just like, "I don't want to do that. I don't, you know." And I really put up every excuse not to. And, um, and then one day I started talking about that I wanted to, I had always wanted to participate in, in a masquerade ball and, you know, just something with fantastical costumes and, 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 and almost thinking of the movie Labyrinth, um, where, 
uh, you know, they're dancing in the ballroom scene. Um, I just wanted something like that. And, and she said, well, why don't you write about that? And, you know, and I kind of rolled my eyes at her and I was like, okay, yeah, you're just trying to get me to put pen to paper. Uh, and, um, and so I finally, one rainy day, um, gosh, it was probably at least, it was probably almost 15 years ago, maybe, maybe a little less than that. Um, I sat down and decided, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to start journaling. And so then I thought, well, if I'm, if I'm sparing myself the reality of this, of, of, of the confines of this world and, and being a human and money and, and all the things that kind of constrain you to, for creating something like that. Um, I thought if I'm not dealing with that reality, then why am I dealing in reality at all? And so I started writing this masquerade ball from the perspective of a young fairy um, and, you know, and, and the things she's encountering and the smells and the music and all of that stuff. So that was what started the writing. And it was like, I just, I couldn't stop. I was writing on paper towels. I was writing while I was driving, which I would never recommend to anybody. <laughs> it's very scary. <laughs> but I mean, it was like anything I could, I was sending myself emails um, and I just couldn't stop writing. And my husband, we were engaged at that point in time. And he said, well, do you think that this is turning into something? And I, you know, and I said, I don't know, but I can't stop. And so lo and behold, um, several books later, uh, um, I, you know, I, I just started cranking out the, the story. I opted to go with the print on demand self-publishing route because I, I started to try to educate myself about traditional publishing and I kept on coming up against the roadblocks of, oh, you need a, you need a, uh, you know, you can't just blindly sell your man or send your manuscript anywhere. They're just going to throw it in the trash. And so, you know, and then they were like, well, you know, you need um, uh, a book agent. And then it was like, well, but you can't get a book agent unless you've got the work. And I thought, well, this is just like how it is in the music industry. You, you know, it's like, you've got to have a busy enough career to warrant having an agent. And, you know, and so I just, I, I decided that I just needed to go the self-publication route and I wanted to maintain hundred percent of my rights, just like you, Caitlin. And, um, and I thought I'm going to get it out. And if I, you know, I was, kind of taking that field of dreams if I write it they will come kind of attitude <laughs> <laughs> and so that was you know that that was I did some research and found a publisher that was really supportive mm -hmm. really wonderful they they offered me a really great package and um and and so I just I just went that route and started you know, troubleshooting as things came up. So that was, that was why I did that. And now I'm in the midst of working on a second edition. So awesome. Thank you. All right. So that's, that's really, okay. So let's talk about, since you've been, all of you've been down the path, almost to completion, all of you, almost all, you're almost all the way there. What have been <laughs> some of the, some of the, okay. Because we're just talking basically about the challenges and rewards. Because if you're an author looking to publish or self-publish, I just want to know what are the roadblocks that you come and how do you how have you overcome them? So let, first, let's talk about the social, emotional, and psychological, both the challenges and rewards. What have you come up against? We'll start with Kate. What comes? Oh, to mind? challenges. So for self-publishing, the hardest part is you pay for everything out of pocket. Uh, one of the hardest parts, actually, the is the finances. Um, I paid out of pocket for my editor. I paid out of pocket for my cover artist. I um, paid for my own formatting software, which it was, it's ridiculously easy. You just plug in the manuscript and it automatically formats it for you in a professional looking manner. And it's great, but it was also expensive. And I had to have a Mac in order to use it, which is fine because I already had one. But I mean, it's just like one thing after the other. It really nickels and dimes you. Um, another thing is I am 
a terrible self critic. Um, I have horrible, horrible, horrible imposter syndrome. Um, I have a bad habit of comparing myself to other authors who have full blown teams um, of editors and artists and proofreaders and developmental editors and helpers and make it a full-time career. Uh, you know, this isn't full-time for me. This is my, this is my hobby. Um, you know, my full-time career, I'm a night shift ICU nurse. So just finding the time and the energy there, sometimes it's just like, if I have a rough week at work, I don't want to write. <laughs> And this one in particular, this manuscript, once I started diving really deep into the mindsets of the characters and the um, the mental health aspect of my characters and the, the LGBTQ community, um, being a recent discovery for myself that I'm of that community, um, you know, it was a lot of self-discovery and a lot of um, a lot of catharsis that I actually ended up giving my first draft to my therapist at the time. And she's like, I see um, Solon being just a violent Latino male version of you. <laughs> so. Um, so for me, a lot of it was the psychological stuff, probably more so than the finances, but the finances is also very difficult. Yeah, no, gosh, that's fascinating. It's fascinating uh, uh, talking to, because therapy can also be very expensive and both of you seem like, uh, to, well, maybe for all of us, um, writing is like a form of therapy in some ways, sort of how we talk to ourselves, but it's also sort of we unearth these other things that um, we conversations that are going on that we didn't know that were happening in our own selves. And then, um, yeah, there's, then of course, there's this element of exposing yourself um, to the, the larger world along the way. Yeah, not to mention the, you know, financial challenges. That's a, that's a whole nother, a whole, whole nother story. Um, April, you could do a whole nother hour long. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my gosh, I don't know if you want <laughs> to get just into all the financial budget, Yeah, the budgeting, I mean, forget about it. But that is an important thing. You know, that's definitely a big, you know, if you're, if you're weighing the options, the finances are a huge part of, of why people choose to go in route or the other. April? Sure. Um, I would echo a lot of what Caitlin said. Um, I'm just kind of mulling in my mind. So when I signed my contract for the Sacred Pulse, it was two months before COVID shutdowns started um, happening across the United States and around the world. So I'd written two chapters. I had outlined my other chapters. And I had promised that I'd turn in my manuscript within six months, which seemed really doable when I signed on the dotted line. But then the whole world profoundly changed. My job changed. Um, I'm a pastor. I had to figure out how are we going to live stream our services? We had no technology for that. So my, my uh, primary vocation was, you know, blowing up and I had to figure out how to put that back together and then I was trying to do the soul work of writing this book and so the primary challenge for me really was that these topics that I thought I knew something about all of a sudden everything I knew didn't apply to the world that we were living in um the the result of that I think is a richer and more profound look at many of the chapters that i ended up writing, but I faced a lot of writer's block, just a lot of writer's block. And really it was that I just, I didn't know how to answer the question myself. You know, I, I thought, for example, my chapter on eating meals, well, obviously if you eat at home around the table, it's so much better than if you go through the drive-through, you know, but what about when restaurants are off the table? What about, you know, can I still be distracted at my dinner table? Can I still disconnect from the people around me, even if I've cooked everything from scratch and I'm doing this all from home and, and trying to, you know, do things the right way, you know, can I still struggle to be present? And I had to confront that reality in myself. Um, so that was, that was, I think the biggest challenge for me was just writing in a whole new world. Yeah, having everyone around you and fewer options for how to manage all yeah. of that with your with your family my gosh that's got to be tricky tiffany um i'm trying to remember the, <laughs> the 
question. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, let's just, it's social, emotional, and psychological challenges and rewards of the publishing process okay. for you. Thank you. And the well, editing and writing process, sure. Well, I mean, I, I feel like I'm, I, I, I'm, I feel like I'm just chiming in because I, I also deal so much with, with the, this horrible critic inside myself and, and, um, and I tell so many writers when they're starting off it's like just don't edit yourself just just get your ideas out because you can get wrapped up in the editing so fast and and but yet I it's I it's a pitfall that I fall into all the time and um and also this the feeling of insecurity and and you know and and you know who's gonna like this <laughs> and why am I doing it and um and so on on an emotional level it's it, it's it was it is still and has been uh really challenging and um and so it's it's you know it and then when you add in the extra stuff like the financial because yes the that that financial hit i mean i i did the same thing i paid for my cover art i paid to you know I, I luckily I had some friends that would do some editing for me but I um, you know it's like you just start handing out money and you're just going and if you stop and take that step back and go wait a minute how much have I put into this over the last few years and it can be really sobering um, so then I feel there's even more pressure to try to be successful with it when you've made this, it's not only the investment of your time and your passion and, 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 you know, and sacrificing your job or your family or, or, or whatever it is to, to make it all come to life. Um, it just then makes the pressure that much higher. And, um, and so that was, that was a huge challenge it still is a huge challenge and um and the pandemic did just it like I thought oh I'm gonna get all this stuff done yeah. <laughs> and it was like mentally I just couldn't yeah. get my mind wrapped around it and so I have a lot I, I mean I did do some writing I did accomplish a bit but it was nowhere mm -hmm. near what you know what I was thinking of and then comparing myself to some of my friends that were you know they were accomplishing so much stuff and so then I'm just like well I'm just uh. <laughs> yeah. it's that imposter syndrome man it's it's no joke. Yeah. yeah. And I talked to some friends who really, you know, they are scholars. They went to school and studied all this. And it's just like, yeah, it, mine started off as a journaling project. <laughs> but that's, I mean, you're, when you're looking into that introspection is really where the, some of the deepest, most powerful stuff is. Yeah. Well, and that's true. And it, I think it's a willingness also then, I mean, thank you for saying that, but it's a, I think then it's a willingness to go there. Um, yeah. Because yes. if you're getting that inspiration to write about it and you can put it in a framework where it's a, somewhat removed from, from you and yet it's still you because you're writing it um you know then it's it you can have some profound impact on other people and that's really exciting um so that's been one of the things that has tried i've tried to be motivated in that way yeah um, so it's uh <laughs> i feel like I'm it's such a juggle <laughs> i'm gonna segue a little bit off of the pandemic because um it's because my job didn't really change much, except that it got a hell of a lot more stressful. Um, oh. We, you know, we're still dealing with, and we're probably dealing with this more now than ever, the nursing shortage. Um, just nurses are burnt out. You know, it's been 21 months of this. And it's, it, you know, with a new variant coming up, it's like, oh my gosh, don't tell me this is going to be a third year of this. Yeah. And then on top of that, with the vaccine mandates and, um, you know, some shockingly nurses refusing to get the vaccine because they feel like their rights trump public health. And it, you know, it, 
you know, it, now that you kind of know my stance on that, but <laughs> we gotta, honestly, like this is a non COVID show. So let's not go too deep so, into the weeds on that. No, side. no, no. But it's just like, we, we see, you know, we're, we're, we're hit hard because we're on the front lines and it's been a very stressful pandemic for a completely different reason than others. I mean, yeah, we have the job security, but at what cost? Yeah. Well, and then I imagine as you are facing that, um, that increased pressure and stress, it's hard to come home and write about serious things. Right. right. I mean, it is. I, right. I mean, yeah. at least like for me, I'm like, put on a happy movie, right. <laughs> cleanse the brain. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of, and I'm kind of in the middle. I, I can't always do that when there's something, when so much serious stuff is going on, it doesn't yeah. seem so I will, you know, turn to psychodramas and then I'll just be like in this, you know, completely different world where I'm neither motivated to create anything new, nor am I, you know, sure. feeling happy. But, um, you know, and that's where we don't, that's the place you really don't want to go. So if you can stay in that middle space where you know how to get yourself back into the creative Absolutely. direction, or at least, you know, yeah. not, you don't have to be producing content every minute, you know, hopefully that was something the pandemic, if anything, has taught us that, and, and really your book, April, does emphasize to a great extent that we're not even doings. That's that right. is not our, our our life's work. You know, it's to be kind, to be loving, just just to exist is is a privilege and an yes. honor. And and I think you know, family like y'all were all have really mm -hmm. strong family mm -hmm. themes, family communication. You know, the really intense. You know, uh, you know, there's like spite and revenge in Tiffany's books. You know, I haven't Kate. Kay was reading to me a little bit from her book. Um, so I'm excited to, to know where and actually get to read it. But where, you know, we learn to interact with each other, hopefully from a place of peace and a place of unity and a place of, um, you know, supporting each other and being creative, even if you don't connect with maybe all the content that's being produced. Yeah. And that's, you know, not something that's really easy for us as artists or as, you know, uh, consumers, I guess, for lack of a better, for a better term. Um, anything else on, uh, I want to ask a question about technical challenges and technological challenges. We don't have to stay on that too long if it just makes you feel frustrated and sad because <laughs> but I, I I think it's important for any publishing adventure like there are gonna be like Kate you mentioned your software there there's new software coming out all the time I've been many people have recommended many different softwares to me and I'm not at the point where I feel like I really need to invest in a different software and take the time to learn a new software but some of it is really useful so who wants to speak to that stuff for a bit jump on um and that's just because i'm currently going through a technical difficulty with um uploading my cover files to ingram spark the it's a self-publishing company um and uh, don't get me wrong i'm i'm incredibly excited about ingram spark they have like i am i'm having it come out through them print on demand it's also ebook paperback hardcover jacketed um including amazon barnes and noble that even distributes to libraries around the world so i'm very excited about that but at the same time it's like my cover i absolutely adore my artist she did a phenomenal job um she evoked the exact emotions i was looking for in a very creative way i am stoked on that um cover reveal hopefully next month um i know so I, I love the cover, but it has to fit the specific template by the pixel. And if it doesn't fit to the pixel, 
it will reject it. And I've had now four times where it says there was a problem processing your cover files. Everything else is fine. But my cover files. <laughs> and and no, you know, nothing wrong with what the artist did, because like I said, the artist did it exactly to the template that was sent. It was a pixel or two off, apparently. <laughs> so those are my technical difficulties at the moment. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That sounds agonizing. And that is one of the reasons I, I don't think that I'll be launching a publishing venture for several years to come. So don't worry about hearing me complain about it for a while because I'm not ready. I'm not ready for all of that stuff. April or Tiffany, you want to chime in? Um, well, I don't have the design or layout technical challenges because the publishing company is doing those things. But my my challenge is more that I get really fatigued reading online. But all of the editing that I need to do for my editor and my publisher is all online. And and most of the copies that get sent out to advanced readers are e-copies. So then I'm asking other people to do all of their reading online. And after a while, like the mind and the eyes are just like, ugh, just need a little screen time break. So I've been have uh, to try to balance that in myself. I've been trying to urge myself back into handwriting. So when I'm doing my writing, I'm writing a lot of things by hand just to give myself that blue light break. Um, but there, there's just a certain amount of screen reading that is necessary. And so I think that's just been, been one of the challenges for me. That's a very important print. one. Yeah, I had to print my manuscript every single time I went for self edits because I just, yep. I couldn't. And that was, you know, I, I didn't want to waste my own ink. So Office Depot, 60, $70 later, cause it's a 500 page manuscript. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, and I that's yeah, that. another another expense. Yeah, I I you know I've been editing manuscripts, um, and and I like to edit in Google Google Docs. If you don't know, if you're not using Google Docs and you're more familiar with Word, I mean Google Docs will let you edit and track changes just by turning on suggestions, which is wonderful. And once I realized that, and of course I just jumped on in. I'm not usually the kind of person that like does a whole lot of reading of software tutorials before I play around with it. Um, you know, I was like, oh, this is fantastic. This isn't hard. I can collaboratively edit with mm -hmm. others. This is wonderful. Because if it were too much more technical, I don't think I could be a freelance editor because yeah. it just would not be worth the frustration of all the, the other hassles that can come along with, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. collaboration. So it isn't really always that hard. I don't want to scare anyone away who wants to write something or edit something or do a collaborative project just but yeah the graphic stuff and 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 paginating like okay so and tiffany i'm gonna come back to you i just want to go up on this little tear like if you want to self-publish on amazon i helped a friend who was who released we released some ebooks which uh um jenny lynn chung wrote a couple of really great books one on skincare and one on uh vocal technique which are you know, they're, they're great. They're, and for anybody who just wants like a, a you know, really simple step-by-step, -step, not, not overly simple, but there's just some really good stuff in there. Um, and it was a lot of fun to work with her on it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not easy going through all those processes. You know, it was a, a real, there's a real learning curve to doing something like that. So just be aware, don't try, don't think that you can do it overnight. Just don't tell yourself that it's something that you're gonna do in a, in a week if the software, if that kind of stuff doesn't already come naturally to you, like prepare, mm -hmm. prepare yourself a little for having to be patient. Tiffany, thoughts? <laughs> I, um, on, a, on a technical end, I, I mean, there was, there was some stuff as far as formatting was concerned that, that my publisher, even being a print on demand publisher took care of, um, where I feel like I made it more difficult for myself was that I thought, I thought I was doing the noble thing and I'm going to save paper. And so I'm going to only put so many, so many spaces in between my chapter breaks. 
And then when you get into that formatting process and they're cutting everything down and, and um, you know, all of that spacing just goes out the window. And so I would have chapter numbers at the bottom of a page with no text underneath it. And so I'd go back and I'd be like, well, can you just bump this over, you know, so that's on the next page, but then that offsets everything after it. And so on, it was, I realized now that I'm reformatting my books that just put a page break in there. It, it will save so much headache for your publisher and for you um, as, as far as making it look like what you want it to look like, which is ultimately as if you have a team of editors and, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, people that are putting it all together for you, that, that that's what they do. Um, I think it's wearing the different hats that was so challenging that I just did not even think was going to be a thing. You know, I, I had started I had started handwriting and I was handwriting and I have notebooks packed of just hand of things that were handwritten and then transferring it over to um, to the computer. I was um, I was using just a PC at that point in time and I loved it and it was great. And then, um, you know, several years later, life starts shifting and I started getting into music composition and, um, and it was recommended for me to get a Mac because the software for music composing and editing is so much better. I, I <laughs> It, there, it's so much more accepted. Yeah, better. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> um, but I, I ended up investing in getting a Mac. And, but then that meant I'm now taking everything that I had in, as Word documents and trying to transfer it over into my Mac, which is not Word. And, you know, and so that was, like, once again, just, you know, I, uh, Th that kind of technical challenge, um, you know, and if I had not switched mid mid series, it might not have been so much of a challenge. But that oh, was gosh. that was one of the that was one of the big things, and and I I've just I've always had a challenge with my artists. I I find people that I love, and I love them as people, and I love their art, and then it's like I just have. I'm not good at task masking, mask getting. I'm not good with cracking the whip. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's been a huge challenge too. Is is that you know I I I feel like I'm I'm doing everything right, and yet I'm not getting anything in a timely manner. <laughs> and so it's like, well, where am I going wrong? But. Yeah, and that's, you know, those, those are the things that are so frustrating as a creative person is that there's sort of like this, you know, what they say, like the creative juices, like you can sort of feel like you step into a flow and, and April talks about there being two different kinds of time, which I think is really relevant to creatives. There's, you know, Kronos time, which you manage and schedule. And then you have Kairos time, which is like, you know, transcendent. It is, you know, can you talk a little bit about that and, and how is a creative that, that those deadlines and all that kind of stuff? I love that question, Betsy. That's awesome. Um, so the deadline is the Kronos time, right? Like you have to get things done by a certain time or they don't get done. Um, but something that I've discovered is that sometimes you have to walk away. You have to take a walk. You need to listen to the birds, you need to play a board game with somebody, um, get lost in someone else's book, um, you know, not the one you're working on, but someone else's. And, and that can help, I think, open up our receptivity or our creativity. Um, sometimes we get so locked into needing to accomplish things by a certain time that we limit ourselves. We think, whatever I need to do to get in you know, by this time, but stepping away, even if it's just for five minutes, um, quick walk around the block or whatever, um, really can get things flowing again. 
Um, but sometimes you also have to write a lot of junky words um, and just show up and write. And I loved what Tiffany said about not editing yourself. Sometimes like I have actually sat down and written on the page. I am having writer's block right now and I do not know what to write. So I am typing until something better comes out. You know, and I've had to do that before. Yeah. Um, and then obviously later you go back and edit out those sentences. But sometimes you just have to give yourself permission to, to let the floodgate open um, and not narrow yourself. That's true. Well, and it's from a producer standpoint, because if you're self-publishing, or even if you're not, even if you have a publisher, you're still your own producer, you are your own boss. And so you, and there's a point, like I physically feel in my body when I am just in a control space and your, your book talks about that too, April, where, you know, you are just trying and, and it's like, and I can almost feel the life drain out of my soul. You know what I mean? When yes. I am just going, why is it this happening? This should be happening now. I did all my part. And why isn't it getting done? Yes. Now this is the time when everybody else should be getting back to me. My inbox is empty. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously there's something else going on in yeah. my development that needs to happen. I am supposed to not make it about the product. You know, it is, a, you know, I'm supposed to walk away and it has nothing to do with me right now. But if I don't remember that, that's when everything goes to hell in a handbasket. I mean, if yes. I'm not careful and that's not just true for books, that's true for performing. It's true for, you know, mm -hmm. a church service or, a, you know, what, what have you that you're trying to trying to get done quote unquote so and and even for this show um we are uh it's 406 we've got 20 minutes left if it's okay for you all to stay since we did start late today um mm -hmm. i you uh tiffany brought up copywriting and isbn number registrating registering registration i can read I would love to talk about that because that's something that, you know, that's a nitty gritty thing that maybe some of our viewers would like to hear more about. What's going on? How do you do that? Who wants to talk about that, Kate? Okay. <laughs> um, so with self-publishing, I, I don't know. I don't know about the traditional publishing world, so I'm not going to pretend to know. Um, as far as the ISBNs are concerned, but in the self-publishing world, you have to purchase your own or you can get your ISBNs through whichever distributors you go through. Now, I know some people will go, they'll get the free ISBN through Amazon, but then if they want to also publish at Barnes & Noble, it's a different ISBN. And if they want to publish through other, you know, it, it, there are ways to get free ISBNs, but they can sometimes be more of a hassle. Um, then there's the Bowker website, which you can purchase your ISBNs, and that is definitely the more expensive route. However, you get to maintain that ISBN across the board. So your paperback novel has the same ISBN, whether it's at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, Kobo, Kindle, what have you. Um, or your paperback and then an ebook has a separate ISBN and then your hardcover has a separate ISBN. So it's, it's just, and then for me, because I know that I'm doing a four part series, I purchased a set of 10 and I'll probably need more. <laughs> and that's but, something that if you're not that detail oriented, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot, some of us as writers are more big picture people and we don't need, you know, it's like, that's something that hopefully you could hire somebody else to do for you or take on, you know, if, if you, if that's something that you're like, that seems like mine, I'm sure that would be mind boggling for a lot of people to try to deal with that on top of, in addition to just yeah hitting the basic deadlines. That's and then, it, yeah. And then just with everything else, when you go to register it through your ISBN number, through the Bowker website, you have to also know what are you going to be pricing it at? what are what are the dimensions of your paperback versus your hardcover like for example my hardcover is a six by nine inch my paperback is a 5.25 inch by eight inch um you have to know those details you have to know okay um you know ingram spark you have to figure out what are you going to charge so that way you're still making a profit because if you're not making a profit it will not let you set that price so and it's well, it's we want you to make a profit my gosh i hope well so. yeah please. absolutely make absolutely a profit on each of your books at the end of the day please don't give and it sometimes and this is something that i've noticed is i feel guilty having to put up the price 
to go up on the price because like, for example, the Australian dollar does not stretch as far as the American dollar. I have to charge almost $40 for my, for my paperback or for my hardcover in Australia versus like $25 here in the States because otherwise I'm not making a profit in Australia. So it's, you know. Wow. Yeah. So, well, I just, I can't wait to hear, you know, back like the next phase of everybody's journey, like telling, you know, I, I'm going to be coming back to you going, well, what happened next? In the next in the next few months um do anyone want to add any thoughts about about those specifications thank you for i learned a lot from that thank you i wanted to say something about what caitlin said about um struggling to raise the price i think that's something that is really challenging about self-publishing i i self-published very poorly a book about 11 years ago and i struggled to price that to where I would see a profit because I think especially women, but many entrepreneurs struggle to put an adequate value on their work. And that's one thing that has been, I'm a crocheter. I do that too. Like I make hats and I feel guilty selling them for what Target charges for their hand produced, you know, mass produced um, works. Um, but that's been one benefit of traditional publishing is that that's completely out of my hands. Now, the downside is I look at the price and I think, oh my goodness, could I ask my friend to pay that much? Mm -hmm. But you're not selling to your friends. Ultimately, oh. the whole point of publishing, right, is that this is supposed to reach a wider audience. Right. And if your friends don't want to pay it, then... You know, I don't know yes. what to tell your friends. I it's, mean, it's true. <laughs> nobody really, nobody really wants to pay our friends anything because they're our friends. You know, yes. like we 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 love it when we can buy from our friends. But like the whole point yeah. is that we're trying to reach people who don't know us. Like we think that we have something to say apart from whether these people are our friends or not. They're for yeah. the wider world, and um, mm -hmm. you know. I would, I don't remember, I'll honestly say April, I don't remember when I paid, when I pre-ordered your book and I would pay a lot of money for this book. It's worth a lot. It's worth a lot to me in this time and I'll never forget it. And I'm not just saying that because I do that. Thank you, Betsy. Yeah. <laughs> Tiffany, thoughts, thoughts on selling. Tell us how, cause you've been, you've been doing this for a long time. So tell us about your experience of sales. Where have you taken your book to sell it? I'd, I'd love to know. I, well, when I, um, I, I was lucky when it came to ISBN numbers, because that was something that even my print on demand publisher took care of. But what I did have to take care of was my copyrights. And, um, and I would recommend to anybody, you've got to protect your work. That is your baby. That is, you know, you have created this thing and, and, and copyright it, register it with the Writers Guild of America. Um, they're actually, it's actually it's actually very easy and it's not crazy expensive, <laughs> although it does add up. But, um, but you know, it, it's getting on the government site to do the copyright can be a little bit daunting. Um, but kind of like once you get yourself through it that first time, then, you know, then it's, it, it actually does make sense and it's not terribly time consuming. Um, it was just the daunting thing of being like, I have to get on a government site and register this thing and it's gonna it, that's how it's gonna be for you know anyway too much pressure i talked about pressure earlier but i um the marketing of it was another one of those things that i just didn't you know i i thought oh well once it's out there people are just gonna buy it and it's just gonna take off and i'll do book signings and it'll be great and and really none of that happened for me um, and so I, um, I, I started reaching out to friends at different conventions and, um, and, and trying to find ways that I could set up a table for, for the weekend. And that of course costs more money. Um, and you've got to go through a screening process. I know for years I was trying to get into San Diego Comic-Con and they kept on telling me, you know, the stars just have to align in the right way. And then, you know, you'll get in. <laughs> and I was, but anyway. Mercury needs I, to be in retrograde. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe this year it'll 
it'll happen. Um, but it was, um, but I did do, a, I did do quite a few conventions and, uh, and sometimes um, what was so amazing about doing the conventions is, is that you get to meet the people that want to buy your your story and they want to meet you and they want to get to know more about the author and they want to you know they they you know they want to they want to touch it and 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 see the pictures and and step into that world before you know before they're stepping into it which is a really beautiful beautiful connection to have with people and uh and you know and then also these conventions you know you're usually sitting alongside somebody at the next table who is also an author or maybe they did a, a graphic novel or maybe you know it, it's um that's been pretty amazing to to be able to to market in that way but it does take a lot of time you know i i, I gave up a lot of weekends to, and went out of town and carted boxes and you know my husband was taking time off of his work so that he could be there too and um you know and, and it's, you know silly things like you're thinking you're sitting at the table and maybe nobody's there at the moment so you're thinking well can I go to the bathroom right now <laughs> you know can I get up and go get some food you know and and you know but you, it, there's that thing in your mind that's saying well no you're gonna miss out if you're not here <laughs> so so that was um so that that was definitely a wonderful but also very challenging part of having the tangible product and and going out there and and I'm not good with self-promotion and trying to feel like I've got to I've got to sell this and it's something that I'm just I don't I know it's not my strong suit and you know and, and so I would find myself trying to find ways instead of I guess I, I mean it was like I was still being honest but I just felt like there was there was a disconnect in there somewhere sometimes because I would just feel like oh my gosh three hours has gone by and I haven't sold anything or the entire day went by and I didn't sell anything and here we are the next morning and I've got to figure out how to how to sell some books and um so it was you know that was one of the challenges that I faced um going to these conventions it's wonderful and and yet it is uh it is it, it's challenging. it's challenging. Absolutely. And even if it's not your own book, you know, as a, uh, this Betsy Freeman booking itself started because someone approached me who had published a book and she said, look, I need some help selling it. And if you can help me, I will offer you a cut of the profits. And she and I both got so um, drawn into so many other different endeavors. That's not something that we're, you know, both even actively doing right now. Although I do love her book and I was able to get, you know, a, to work on that a little bit, but it really sparked something. And it's hard and it's interesting how some people, you know, will go, a lot of us feel like finishing the book, having it in our hands is the finish line because we do not know how to market. We do not want to mess with it. And so, I mean, my, yeah, that's honestly, that's my biggest advice from having now worked with a lot of authors is before you publish, before you get to that day, start enlisting your team that is going to help you in one way or the other and let them have a stake in your profits. Let them succeed with you because it's not easy to see the finish line and nobody knows what the finish line is. There is no real finish line because you're going to always want to be writing and publishing. You're always going to have more to say, and your book will live forever now. It's on paper. It's not going to die. People, you know, it'll live longer than you will. I mean, that's depressing, but it's true. Um, you know what I mean? Like it's here, it's not going yeah. away and it'll bless people for generations, your children, your nieces and nephews, your friends and family will remember your book you know, like they remember you. And if nothing else, I mean, you, we all have lots of stories to tell. But mm -hmm. beyond that, I mean, I think that you all have, you obviously all have a much wider audience than that. And you need some people that really believe in your project. Um, actually, that's kind of a good note to end on. And Tiffany, you mentioned that too, that like your support, 
you know, sometimes you have great support and sometimes you don't, you don't need to, we don't, you don't need to tell any more than you feel comfortable, but do you all want to talk about um, what, what that's been like for each of you? I, I, I guess I can start since, <laughs> since it looks like I raised the question. <laughs> It's, it's I, 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 um, I mean, my husband has been my rock through this whole thing. He's been my, my biggest supporter and, um, and, 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 you know, just wonderful. I, I've, I've been blessed with a, a family that is also very supportive. Um, and, and friends too. I mean, friends that even came out of the woodwork, friends that I, that I would never have reached out to and said, Hey, can you help me with this? And, and, and it just kind of happened, you know, or people that I didn't even know liked the genre stepped forward and said, Oh my God, I loved your book. When are you releasing another one? And I was just like, wow. Awesome. <laughs> um, so that kind of support has been, has, has been just, you can't put a price on that. I mean, you know, I have a couple of dear friends that have been my editors since day one, and they are some of, you know, my most trusted and closest friends, and they know that they can be brutal, and that I'm not gonna, you know, like, take it, I might take it personally, but I won't take it out on them. <laughs> <laughs> That's serious. That's serious, uh, thick skin that you have. I will admit I don't have I, that thick of skin, but I know I have it. I don't necessarily have it either. So I pick my critics carefully. Yeah. Like I already know, I already know when it comes to reviews and everything, I'm gonna try, like I'll I'll I have to try and mentally prepare myself for the inevitable negative reviews because it, there's no such thing as a all five star, all four star reviewed book. Your book's not going to be for every reader. You're going to have negative reviews. It's just a fact Definitely. of life. Yeah. And that's something that I have to mentally prepare myself for so I can look at these negative re reviews and be like, okay, what can I objectively glean from this to improve in the next edition or to improve in the next volume? Um, and that's something that that we almost, it, it's easy for us creatives to to not to forget that side of it is like, okay, so the, the negative reviews and the criticisms we need to try and take as constructive, like, okay, this is something that I can improve on. There, there seems yeah. to be a trend here um, and look for that rather than, you know, don't look at the one-star reviews that say, oh, you had a gay character. Now I don't like your book. It's like, oh, well, that sounds like a personal problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, no. yeah, of course, of course. And April, you've had a lot of experience um, you know, you've got, you had some really great people writing for the back of your book jacket, for example, that read yes. it and gave you some great advanced praise. Um, and the introduction and the forward were really wonderful too. And they're, and they're actually really good setup to prepare you sort of to, to read your book. Well, what has that experience been like for you? You know, I had somebody ask me the other day, um, a, a fellow writer, um, sent me an email and said, how did you get such big name writers to endorse the back of your book? Like, how did you do that? And I, I thought about it before I responded. And honestly, um, it wasn't anything that I did there. Um, the first one, Kristen Cobus Dume, who, um, endorsed my book. She and I happened to serve on an editorial board of an online magazine together for a little while. And as I was writing, I just asked her, hey, if I ever get this thing published, would you read it? And if you like it, would you say something nice about it? And she said, sure. And so when I got a contract, she made good on that. And a month later, she ended up on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, you know, it, so it wasn't, I didn't go seeking a big name. It just happened. Um, but it's amazing how those people can get put in your path, um, yeah. and, and you can help each other. You can amplify yeah. each other's books and messages. Um, but, but I have just been so thankful for the people who have been cheerleaders along the way. My husband's been amazing. My kids have been amazing. You know, I was trying to school them online while I was also writing and so I tried to make my own little private writing area in my house. 
And they would come up and they would bring me Hershey's Kisses or some peanut butter filled pretzels. And they're like, keep going, mom. They, um, this was really sweet. One of the first times my kids got to go back inside a physical store, they came home and gave me this little thing. I don't know if you can read it, but it says never give up. Oh. Um, oh. Because they knew I was like, I was having a hard time pushing through. Um, it was a major writer's block week or month or whatever. And they're like, you can do it, mom. My, my 14 year old says, you know, in my book is about spiritual topics. So I figured he'd be like embarrassed about his mom's book, but he said, mom, you have to finish this. Think of all the cred that's going to get me at school, <laughs> you know, but just little things that I'm like, oh, they care. And they're cheering me on in their own cool way. And, and that's invaluable when you're writing, because it is a vulnerable process. Yes. Yes, it's it also is. a very isolated process because yes. ultimately you're, I mean, you're interacting with people when it comes to getting things done, but the actual yeah. act yes. of writing is very isolated yes. and that can, it can really drain you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's a really important point. You know, at the end of the day, like, you know, you can be your best cheerleader, your worst critic, um, but you're going to come back. It's your product. You know, what you put out there is it's got your name on it and you got to make sure that it represents what you really want it to want it to say. And um, I, I wish that for all of you in the future. I really look forward to having you all back again um, to speak about your books. Um, we're going to do lots more of these because it's one of my favorite things to talk about is your books. <laughs> um, so, yes. So I please, please urge you to uh, post the links again so that we can pre-order and order your books and read them. Um, thank you for everyone who watched. I saw we had some very faithful viewers through us, uh, uh, through this um, hour. And uh, please leave your comments and questions for the authors below. So this can continue to be an interactive event. Alrighty, I'm gonna take us off of live now. Thank you everybody.